up soon and hello Facebook audience I'm waiting on, I'm on my periscope to get in line all right getting everything recorded here there we go hello periscope and hello Facebook audience prophet David Taylor here for my weekly live prophetic word so now you know my tagline. My tagline is the same every week. What's my tagline? My tagline is that God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. One more time. God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his servants, the prophets. All right? When you come on this broadcast, please like and share. It helps me get the word out. The more likes and the more shares, shares I get, then both Periscope, Periscope and Facebook uh, will promote and it'll rise in the ranks because we want to be sure that everybody in the body of Christ can receive the prophetic word. If you want to support me financially, you can give do, uh, donations on my PayPal.me link. That's in my Periscope file and it's also on the Facebook Live page. And then also uh, you, there's an Amazon Smile link. So that means a portion of anything you spend on Amazon, you can choose my not-for-profit, Prophet David Taylor, and a portion will go to that. And, of course, the music is coming up. I'm here every Sunday, <clears throat> 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time live. That's my regular time. And then on the second Thursday nights, the second Thursday of every month at 7 o'clock p.m., I do a broadcast called No More Genies, where I'm talking about breaking the genie concept of God because genie concept has really messed up a lot of people. So we break the genie concept of God, and we work on getting the truth. I just had one uh, last Thursday. It was really blessed. So you can look it up here. So the best way to find me is to hashtag PDT, because I hashtag everything I do online um, with my prophetic ministry. So hashtag PDT. And if you want to look up the No More Genie series, then hashtag PDD, hashtag NMG. And you can find there's five so far, five teachings, okay? All right, <clears throat> so let's get started today. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time. I should speak through my mouth, my mouth, O oh God. I am a yielded vessel to you, O oh God, because we want to hear what you have to say. It's what you to say through your spirit, O oh God, and through your word, not what we have to say. So thank you for an opportunity to hear from you. Please bless this time and help us to receive the engrafted word of God, which can save our souls. We thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, today's <clears throat> uh, topic is called Unusual Blessings. Okay, again, today's topic is called Unusual Blessings. Unusual Blessings, okay? Our scripture reference is Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Exodus is the second book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, it's uh, one of the books that Moses wrote, second book in the Bible and second book in the Old Testament. So Genesis is the first book, Exodus is the second book, uh, chapter 17, and we're going to be reading verses 8 through 16, okay? I'm reading out of the NIV version, okay? All right, here we go, <clears throat> starting with verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite, Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Wow. Okay, that's action-packed. Uh, again, the name of our subject is Unusual Blessings. So let's take it from the top. Because what does that mean? 
unusual blessings. Okay, it means that there are some blessings, now don't misunderstand what I'm saying, there are some blessings that we would call normal or regular or everyday. When I say don't misunderstand what I'm saying, I mean don't take them for granted. You need to thank God for the usual stuff, the regular stuff. Do not take life for granted. I have learned through living, don't take life for granted. But I mean like air, I mean like, you know, time, I mean like sunshine, I mean like, you know, the grace to make it through another day, things like that, food. You know, I will say those were our, our usual blessings or blessings we expect or we need every day. So then unusual blessings can be defined as blessings that are outside of the norm, stuff that doesn't happen every day, okay? Uh, hello, God bless you. Stuff that doesn't happen every day. Those would come under the, the, the topic of unusual blessings. So what's that got to do with our scripture reference? Well, I'll tell you, okay? So, hey, Bongi, how you doing? God bless you. So, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Now, if you know anything about Amalek, uh, now, let me explain to you something about the Old Testament, but really the entire Bible. When you see things in the Old Testament in particular, they, they tend to be not just the thing, but also they represent something. They represent a greater truth. And that is very consistent with the way God teaches us about things. Because God used things, uses things that we can see to help us understand things that we can't see. And God uses things in nature to help us understand spiritual truths. So many times when you see people or things or events or places in the Bible, it doesn't just represent that one particular thing. Okay? There's some symbolism. There's some things attached to it. And one of the things that you need to understand about Amalek Amalek, the Amalekites, represent the flesh. The flesh is that rebellious nature, that carnal nature, that nature that was born when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and we became the opposite of God. We became backwards from God. We became disconnected from God, and we became dead. Well, Amalek, the Amalekites, represent that nature. I don't have time to tell you why there's a genealogy and lineage or whatever, but they represent that nature. So when it says the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim, what that's really symbolic of is how uh, the flesh or fleshly people will come attack spiritual people or they will war. And that's in the New Testament where it talks about abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. So your carnal desire is always going to be warring against your soul trying to destroy you. So this physical battle with Amalekite attacking Israel is representative of the spiritual battle that we face every day of the, the flesh nature trying to war against our soul and warring against the spirit. So Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now I just talked about this on Thursday. Do you notice what Moses said? Moses did not say why did God let this happen to us? That's not what Moses said. What Moses said was, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites because you've got to fight. I talked about that on Thursday night, so watch my No More Genies Part 5 because you've got to fight. Moses had the right response. Moses didn't whine to God about, I can't believe you let this happen to me. Okay? you got to fight. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Holy cow, there's so much symbolism in that. Moses said, I'm going to stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Okay? So first of all, when you come up against the enemy, you have to stand. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill. And then he says, uh, I'm on top of the hill. So Moses was overlooking the battle. Okay, so that's position of being above only. I'm on top of the battle, even though it's happening beneath me. And then he said, I'm going to stand up there with the staff of God in my hands. The staff of God in my hands. In other words, I'm not going up there empty handed. I'm going up there. Now, the staff of God in Moses' hand, remember, represented God's power being with Moses. Because when God first uh, called him from the burning bush, God told Moses to throw his staff on the ground and it became a snake. And then God told Moses to pick it up by the tail, and then we picked it up, it became a staff again. So God was showing Moses that that staff is representative of the fact that God's power was with Moses. 
So Moses understood that he had to go with the staff of God, okay, to the top of the hill. He had to go with God's power in his hands to win the battle, okay? Today, that's representative of the Holy Spirit, okay? You have to have God's power to win the battle. That's why so many people quote scripture, but they ain't got no power. The, the power comes from the Holy Ghost, okay? You have to be spirit-filled. You have to walk in the spirit. The spirit of God is the one that releases the power to make the word come to pass. Because when God created the world, the Bible said that the, the earth was out form and void and darkness uh, covered the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the waters, getting ready to bring what father and son said to pass. And God said that there be light and there was light. Because the spirit of God is the one that energizes, that ignites, that makes alive the word of God and makes it come to pass. That's why you have to have the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's why you got to be spirit filled. So Moses understood all that. Moses understood that I'm supposed to be on top of this, even though the battle is happening underneath me. And I need the power of God in my hands to win. Okay, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Now, Joshua. In Hebrew, that's Yeshua. That's another name for Jesus. In Hebrew, the English word Joshua can also be translated Yeshua, which is another name for Jesus. Joshua in the Old Testament is a type of Christ. Joshua is the one that brought the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua also led many of the fights. Joshua led the battles. And that's what Jesus Christ does for us in the New Testament. He's the one that brings us out of the wilderness, out of the world, into God's plan for our lives. And he's the one that goes before us to fight. You see that? I told you this whole passage is full of symbolism. So it said, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Verse 11, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Now look at that. Now what does that mean? That means as long as you stay in prayer, holding up hands can represent a lot of things. As long as you stay in prayer, uh, Moses held the staff of God in his hand. As long as you're spirit-filled, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as long as you worship. All of that is talking about your connection with God. So it says, as long as your connection with God is right, you're worshiping, you're praying, you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you can beat the flesh. But whenever Moses lowered his hands, when you're not walking in the Spirit, when you're not walking in the Word, when you're not continual in prayer, then that's when your flesh gets a hold of you. And I know that's true. You know how you know that's true? All you have to do is not be in the Word for 24 hours, and before the sun sets, that old nature going to rise back up. It's the most amazing thing. I don't care if you've been saved for 45 years. I don't care if you've got the Holy Ghost running out your toes. I don't care if you sneeze in tongues. If you have a day where you don't spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer in the presence of the Lord and get spirit-filled, that old nature going to rise back up every time. Okay? When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands were made steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So what does that represent? That represents your support in the body of Christ, that you can get tired fighting the devil. And let me stop here a moment to say that if you are tired, if you're getting weary in your battle, do not feel guilty. Many times, many times we stop fighting because we feel so guilty because we feel like we're supposed to be up all the time. But the Bible says right here that Moses' hands grew tired and they had to put a stone underneath him. So he's still on top of the hill, but he had to sit down and rest. And then he needed some people to support him, one on each side. Okay? So as long as Moses' hand was up. So that means that sometimes when you run out, you need your support group to hold you up. So you can keep praying, keep fasting, stay in the spirit, keep worshiping, and keep walking in the power of God. You need help. And as long as you do that, then Joshua's in the, bad, in the valley overcoming the Amalekite army for you, okay? So check this out. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Uh -huh. And make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. This is huge. I know a lot of modern day Christians don't do this. When God gives you a victory, you're supposed to write it down. You're supposed to mark the occasion. God taught the Jews that in the Old Testament all the time. Every time God did something significant for them, there was a marker 
Do you know why? So that when you are in your next battle, you can look at that old mark and remember that God delivered you from that battle. So when they crossed the Jordan River and when the walls of Jericho fell, and, and if God did that, God did already did that for me when I look at that old marker, then I understand that means he's going to help me win this battle too. So that's a practice that a lot of New Testament believers I don't necessarily think engage in. But that comes from the Old Testament, but it's still real. He said, write it on a scroll as something to be remembered. You're supposed to remember when God helped you win. Because when you get in your next fight, the remembrance of the victory of that last fight will keep them arms up. Okay? Make sure that Joshua, hear it, Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So that means that even after Moses was dead, when Joshua was driving the children of Israel forward into the promised land, Joshua need to under, needed to understand that God was going to completely destroy the Amalekites. So in other words, God was prophesying to Joshua his victory before it happened. And that's really something. When God tells you what's going to happen before it happens, it gives you a whole new world of confidence when you learn how to walk by faith. When you hear the voice of the Lord or when you get a promise from God, if your faith is right, if your faith is up to par, you understand that if God says it, once the Lord says it, it's going to come to pass. And God wanted Joshua to know that he was going to wipe out the Amalekites. So Joshua didn't have to be afraid. Joshua also didn't need to make any deals or bargains with them, just like we don't need to make any deals or bargains with the flesh. Okay? Moses built an altar. There it is again, marking the occasion, building an altar, and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Okay, now there's a promise and a blessing in there I don't want you to miss, because you can't really see it at surface glance. But Moses said, he built an altar, and he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. You know what that means? That means when your flesh and or your enemies come at you, you need to make a point to pray and lift up your hands and praise God and, and honor your God in a situation. Because if you do that, then the Lord will fight that battle for you from generation to generation. Look at that. What a promise from God. Why do you think so many, so many people are defeated? I'll tell you why. Because... Things go from generation to generation, which is why sometimes your grandfather, your father, and you all have the same weaknesses. How do you break that cycle? You break up that cycle because somebody has to lift up their hands to God. And when you lift up your hands to God and you bring the Lord in the situation, then he makes a promise. You build an altar and call the Lord your banner. So in other words, I'm not no longer going out in my name. I'm going out in his name because he's my banner. He's my covering. He's the flag that goes before me before I fight. And if you do that, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. God, your enemies are God's enemies, and God's enemies are your enemies, and he'll fight them for you. Understand? That's a promise that'll still be working when you're dead. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you lift up holy hands in prayer and fasting and believing and worship to God now, your kids will be reaping the benefit long after you're gone. That the Lord will remember the altar you built to him when you called him your banner. And he'll go before your kids and fight them same enemies in their generation. What a blessing. See, that's the kind of stuff I like. Because that means if I serve God in my, my lifetime, I'm setting my kids and my grandkids up for a blessing that I don't even have to be here to see him have. Because God makes me a promise while I'm alive, if I do that, He's going to keep fighting from generation to generation. What a promise. That's why I tell you every week that there are advantages to being a Christian. Now, many times when I was growing up, I heard a lot about the suffering and I heard a lot about the cross, and that's right. But I'm saying sometimes we don't talk enough about the advantages of being a Christian, about the advantages of serving God in your lifetime, and this is one of those promises. So the next time you come up against your enemies, instead of fighting the way you usually fight, remember today's title is Unusual Blessings. Instead of fighting the way you usually fight, lift up holy hands, lift up the power of God, walk in the spirit, lift up hands of praise, 
unto the Lord your God and bring God in a situation. And guess what will happen? When you start calling him, the Lord is my banner. Because you're lifting up hands to his holy throne, he's going to war against those enemies even when you're gone. He'll fight those enemies for and with your kids. See that? Because I know the opposite is also true. I also know that if nobody in the family ever honors God, the same thing that killed your father is going to kill you. And the same thing that kills you is going to kill your kids. Haven't you seen people struggle with the same thing from generation like somebody in the family is an alcoholic, and then the next two or three generations, alcohol, get them all. You know why? Because nobody ever lifted up hands and said, the Lord is my banner. They never said, let the Lord cover me while I fight this alcoholism. You see, that's why. That's how you get a new line of blessing in your family. You call the Lord your banner and you lift up hands to God. You see that? But there's even more. The name of this, of this uh, prophetic word is unusual blessings. Okay? So you know what that means? That means that just like it's unusual for Moses to be able to just go on the top of the hill and just hold his hands up, and Joshua's down in the valley fighting, and he can win as long as Moses holds his hands up. That means that there's some battles and some blessings that you're going to get. Hello, Mary, how are you? That means there's some battles and some blessings you're going to get in the days to come just by holding your hands up in prayer and praise to God. That's why Christians that don't praise the Lord don't walk in the same level of blessing. Now, I want you to notice that. I want you to notice what happens to Christians that make a point to worship and hold up hands to God. Just like I told you at the top of the hour, Christians that make a point to walk in the Spirit. As opposed to Christians who don't. I want you to notice that there's a different level of blessing. There's a different level of blessing when you hold up your hands in prayer and praise and worship than for Christians that don't. And God has promised He's going to blot out the name of Amalek, uh, Amalek from under heaven. You know what that means? That means that God can wipe out an entire family. Might be some wicked people coming up against you who make it their business to persecute you, who want to make it their business to destroy you or destroy your name or destroy your witness or destroy your testimony or destroy your ministry or take your money or take your health. When you praise God, when you hold up holy hands, when you walk in the power of God, you know what that means? That means can God, God can do this to the whole family. God can wipe the family out because God knows how to shut the mouths of his enemies. That's why you need to do what Moses did and lift your hands up. And when you get tired, then call your friends and say, I need some help. I need some help. I need you to help me keep my hands up because I'm tired. But I got to keep praying. I got to keep fasting. I got to keep praising. Got to keep walking in the spirit. But I'm tired. And when you do that, then you get this unusual blessing coming in where not only is Joshua going to be in the valley fighting the battle for you, but God is going to blot the name out of those enemies from under heaven. And the Lord's going to be at war from generation to generation. You understand that? You need that kind of blessing to establish something generational in your family. What do I mean by that? I mean that everything that you learn and everything you do and everything you build while you live is not supposed to die with you. It's supposed to be passed on. It's supposed to endure to the next generation. But some people, I want you to notice that when they die, everything they did dies with them. We're not supposed to die like that. We're supposed to die with a legacy. We're supposed to die with something that's rolling forward that we created in our lifetime, and that won't happen if you don't honor God with it. If you don't honor God with it, it's going in the ground with you, and that's not what you want. If you honor God with it, God will make it roll forward in the generations, and that's an unusual blessing. And that's why you can find so many people that, think about it, have praying grandmothers. If you had a praying mother or a grandmother, I guarantee you, there have been some of your classmates that you went to school with that are dead. And you have done worse stuff and you have been in worse danger and you still here. Do you know why? It's because your mother or your grandmother lifted up hands to God and God put his banner over you and God had mercy on you because of the prayers of your grandmother. That's how important this stuff is. Do you see that? 
So that's why, okay, right, and the Holy Spirit is telling me this too. The other thing that God wants us to get ready for is unusual blessing. Now, this word already came forth in January of this year. January of this year, more than one prophet said this was going to be a year and a season of unusual blessings. So I'm just confirming. The Spirit of God has just given me another word of confirmation. You can look it up on YouTube. Look up unusual blessings and you'll see what I'm talking about. What does that mean? That means things like foreclosures and bankruptcies in your favor. That means people selling houses for like pennies on the dollar in your favor. That means like getting a new car for a used car price. That means like having your rent paid. That means getting a scholarship uh, to pay your tuition or maybe even a full ride. That means they said they weren't going to let your kids into school and then something happened and all of a sudden they find a slot or they find some money and they let your child in and the tuition is covered. Unusual stuff like that. We're in a season like that. So I know what you're going to say. Could you say the same thing people always say? You say, well, Prophet Taylor, if that's the case, if that's what God is saying, how come all Christians don't get it? That's a good question. And here's the good answer. It's because you have to believe it. Okay? You can't, it's not all up to God. God does the God part. <laughs> God does the stuff that only God can do. But you've got to do the you part. And it works like this. The Bible said that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The way God created this visible world was to use a substance called faith to pull it from the invisible to the visible. So in other words, there was light in the invisible realm. When God said, let there be light, he pulled light from the invisible realm out here to the visible realm, and then he shaped it into the sun and the moon and the stars. That's literally how God made the world. He used a substance called faith. Faith is a spiritual substance like love and hope. Where does love live? Love lives in your heart. Love don't live anywhere but in your heart, if you think about it. You can't go to Walmart and get a six-pack of love. Where does hope live? Hope lives in your heart. Hope don't live nowhere else but in your heart. You can't go to Target and get a 32-ounce can of hope. Okay? Hope is a spiritual substance. Love is a spiritual substance. They live in your heart. Well, faith is a spiritual substance, but it's a substance that you use to pull the blessings of God that he tells you that are already there in the invisible out here where you can see them and have them in your hand. So that means when the Lord makes a promise, you have to add your faith to it to get that promise in your life. Just because you hear the word of God that's the God part. God did his part by giving us the word and giving us the Holy Ghost. But for it to manifest in your life, you got to use your faith. So what does that look like? I'll show you. What that looks like is you got to believe it in your heart. You have to believe it for real. You can't be going through the motions. What's the difference between going through the motions and believing it for real? A man walks across Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow and everybody claps and cheers. The man says, do you believe I can do it again? The audience says, yeah. Man gets walks across the uh, Niagara Falls on a tightrope on top of a wheelbarrow. The audience cheers. Man said, you believe I can do it again? The audience says, yeah. Man turns around, walks across the tightrope on a wheelbarrow. The audience cheers. Man says, do you believe I can do it again? The audience says, yeah. Then the man says, then get in the wheelbarrow. That's the difference between going through the motions and believing it for real. As long as you're sitting somewhere on the ground watching somebody else on a tightrope, this is all you doing. you talking. Of course you believe that. That ain't costing you nothing. You don't have to do nothing. If you really believe, he can make it across again. You get in the wheelbarrow. That's the difference between Christians. So you have to really believe it. You can't just be saying you believe it, number one. Number two, once you believe, really believe it in your heart, you got to confess it with your mouth. you got to say it. You have to authorize it because we have dominion on earth. We're made in God's image, and God gave the earth realm to us. You have to authorize the blessings of God with your mouth. That's why you have to watch what you say. You have to quote the scripture and believe it. You have to release the word of God in the earth realm in your life. You can't believe that God is going to heal you of sickness, but walk around and keep confessing how sick you are. You have to say, by his stripes I am healed. You have to say healing is the children's bread. So you have to look up the scriptures on healing and you have to say it. And you have to keep believing it and you have to keep saying it 
and you have to keep praying it until it comes out here where you can hold it in your hand. That's your part. So that's why you have people that go to church for 30 years and they never change. That's why people that you have, they go to church for 30 years and they never get the blessings they talk about. You know why? Because they don't really believe it and they ain't really saying it. They're not confessing it. They don't believe it in their heart and they're not authorizing the blessing to show up with their mouth. You got to pull it out here with your faith. You've got to use the spiritual substance of faith and pull it from the invisible to the visible. Well, uh, what if it's a big blessing? Then you have to increase your faith because your faith is only going to pull out what you believe. So in other words, if you need $10,000, but you only really believe God can give you $500, then $500 is all that's going to show up. If you need $10,000 and you believe God is going to give you $10,000, you have to keep saying, God has given me $10,000 and keep saying it every day until that money's in your hand. See that? And I know many times in our religious backgrounds, people don't explain this kind of stuff. You hear stuff in church and everybody shouts and people run around the church and everybody fall out and everybody gets slain in the spirit, good with the Holy Ghost, everybody speaking in tongues. Oh, we had a good time today, child. And your life doesn't change. That's because... They didn't teach you how to pull those blessings into your life. You got to really believe it in your heart. You got to get in the wheelbarrow. What does that mean practically? That means you can't be running around talking about how God is going to bless your business and you never open the business. You got to go to the bank, open a bank account. You got to go to the federal government. You got to get your EIN. You got to think of the name of the business. You got to get your marketing strategy. You got to get your brand, your logo. You got to do the stuff that comes along with building a business. That's getting in the wheelbarrow because a whole lot of people just want to sit back and just, you know, I'm going to wait till everything lines up and it doesn't work that way. You got to get in the wheelbarrow. So you got to do your part uh, for people that are always talking about how they want to get married. <laughs> you know why some of the people never get married? Because they never do the things that would attract the spouse because they keep saying God's going to, God's going to, God's going to. Okay, God. what God is going to do is cause somebody to come across your field of vision. God's going to cause somebody to be somewhere in the vicinity of your life. But you have to be attractive enough to them as spouse material. Or else why in the world would you think they would want to marry you? And a whole lot of people have been talking about God's going to for a long time. But they're not doing the things that they need to do to actually get ready to get married. That's why they can't attract the spouse. Because if somebody's looking to get married, they're looking for spouse material. And you can't fake that. You can't fake being a husband if you're not really a husband. You can't fake being a wife if you're not really a wife. If you didn't know that. See? Because you don't really believe it. That's why you can't pull it into your life. You understand? All right. So, expect in this season, okay, Spirit of God has given me a word I need to release. For behold, my people, I've spoken through my prophet to, to alert you to unusual blessings. You need to feed your faith for the unusual. Study Elijah and Elisha and study the miracles, the miracle working of power of God, where I gave children to women with barren wombs, where I gave children to older couples, where I caused oil to multiply to pay off debts, where I cured uh, food poisoning, I cured the stew in the pot, where I made the axe head float, where I did all these miracles, study the unusual miracles, the unusual works, to prepare your mind and heart to receive unusual things from me, because I'm not going to come in this season in the usual way. I'm coming in the unusual way, so be prepared, my people, so that you can receive the fullness of what I have for you because it's not going to look and it's not going to come the way you think it's going to look and the way you think it's going to come. So be ready so you don't miss a blessing, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Now, I receive that. I'm ready for that. I'm like, if God's got some unusual stuff and I need to feed myself some Elijah and Elisha word, I'm on it. I'm going to listen to some of that as soon as I get through with this broadcast because I want my mind and my heart to be ready because if God has already prophesied, he's not going to be doing the usual things. That means some stuff's going to come that's going to look like it come out of nowhere 
you're not even going to be able to explain it. Okay? And I guarantee you some Christians are going to some Christians are going to get it and some Christians won't. Some people are going to be talking the same talk this time next year. November of 2019, some children of God are going to be in the same place they are right now, I'm sad to say. But some of us that believe God, that really believe it in here and really speak it out here, are going to get ready for them unusual blessings. For God to bless you in ways he's never blessed you before. Stuff that you didn't see coming. Okay? That, amen, I receive it. Amen. Anna said she received it. That's right. Because you got to believe it. You got to pull that stuff by faith. You got to be ready. What if God gives you uh, this year, uh, what if instead of getting a financial bonus on your job, what if God gives you two plane tickets to a country you've never been to before? Would you go? What if a lawyer calls you, and it's a legit lawyer, it's not a Nigerian scam, and a lawyer calls you and said you had a relative you didn't know about, and they left you some real money? What would you do? Do you have a plan for a bunch of money? Would you know what to do with a financial windfall? What if you are going to a conference out of town, and when you're at that conference, you meet someone, and the Holy Ghost come upon you and say, that's your husband, that's your wife. Would you know what to do? Would you be ready for that? What if you're in church and you're worshiping and you're praising God and then your pastor starts preaching and then God opens up the heavens and God shows you a five-year vision? God shows you what he wants to do in your life for the next five years in a moment of time. Could you handle that? Would you be ready for that? What if some people you don't normally talk to, maybe people that even speak another language, maybe people where English is not their primary language, what if they walk up to you and they even speak it through a translator and they open the door to a whole other country? Could you handle that? See, that's unusual stuff. That's unusual stuff. That's stuff that you can't even see that coming. You just got to be ready when it happens. Okay? All right. Now we're going to release the power of God because the power of God is always, always what makes a difference. Okay? Uh, the power of God is what makes a difference. The Holy Ghost is what makes a difference in your life. So... Okay, the Holy Ghost is telling me somebody's watching got headaches. You said that to me also on Thursday night. Headaches. In the name of Jesus. If you've got headaches, put your hand on the screen. In the name of Jesus, I release the power of God to you. And you will feel the anointing flow through the screen and heal your headache. Okay? In the name of Jesus, by his stripes you are healed. And that headache, that headache is gone. Okay? God is saying to some of you out there, your healing is going to come through your diet. Some of you watching me, you need to change the way you eat. And when you change the way you eat, you're going to feel better and live longer and everything in your body is going to work better. So God is saying to some of y'all, your healing is in your diet. All right. All right. Mm. The Lord is saying that some of you... Uh, you have the enemy in your ear, and he's feeding your unbelief. So in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that unbelieving spirit. I rebuke that demon of unbelief, that skepticism. That's the voice of Satan. Satan says, has God really said, in Genesis chapter 3, he said to Eve, did God really say, don't eat of every tree? That's skeptical. That voice that's producing doubt, that's the devil. I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. I rebuke the voice of doubt and skepticism. He also said to Jesus in Matthew 4, if thou be the son of God, that's the devil. You don't have to prove nothing to nobody. You don't have to prove you are who you are. That's the devil. So I rebuke that spirit of doubt. I rebuke that spirit of skepticism. And I break it off you right now in Jesus' name. And any spirit, person, voice, whatever that comes in your life that says, well, if you so saved, that's the devil. Put the word on that. You don't have to listen to that. Jesus did not take the stones and make them bread. He didn't have to prove he was the son of God. The devil said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And the Lord did not do it because he did not have to prove to the devil that he was who he said he was. And you don't have to prove to the devil or wicked people that you are who you say. If they laugh at you being a prophet, let them laugh. If they laugh at you being a Christian, let them laugh. All that laughing they doing, God's going to turn it back on them. For it's all over, God going to laugh at them. That's right. That's right. So I rebuke that spirit of doubt. I rebuke that spirit of skepticism. I rebuke that spirit of proving. And I break it off you right now in Jesus' name. You'll feel it snap off your head.
okay? And never let that voice come back in your life. All right? All right, if you have any prayer requests, please put them on the screen. Otherwise, I'm going to pray a closing prayer. I want you to help me get this prophetic word out to millions of people because I truly believe that as the Spirit of God speaks through the prophets, the body of Christ needs to hear it. So I want you to like and share this video. So if you're on Facebook Live, please like this video and please share it. If you're on Periscope, please like this video and please share it. Uh, and then I'm loading uh, very slowly, but that's going to pick up. I'm loading my stuff on YouTube and SoundCloud. Uh, but please uh, share these videos and like them so that the, the Word of God, as the Holy Ghost releases it, can get out to millions of people. Because the body of Christ is worldwide. And everybody needs a prophetic word. Okay? Okay, I don't see any prayer requests. All right, then I'm going to pray a quick closing prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, O God, for unusual blessings, O God. I believe you, O God, and I receive it. And I'm super excited about the blessings that you're going to send in my life and all those that heard this word and all those that believe you, O oh God. So I just ask you to, to uh, keep our eyes open, keep our ears open, God. We want to stay alert. We want to fill our spirit with faith so that you, when you do those unusual things, we can receive them. And we have enough faith to receive them and pull them out here from the invisible to the visible so we can walk in them. And we thank you for being a God of unusual blessings. And we thank you for the promise of your word that when we hold our hands up to you in prayer and praise, when we walk in the power of God, and when we call you the Lord, our banner, the one that covers us and goes before us, that you make a promise to defeat the enemies, and that you make a promise that you will war against those enemies from generation to generation and blot their name out from the face of the earth, a promise that will still you'll still be working on after we're dead. What a mighty God we serve, God. I just got to give you a clap praise for that. I just got to give you praise to that, oh God. What a mighty God we serve. You can do more for us than we could ever do for ourselves. So it's a privilege and a blessing and an honor to praise you. So we give you the praise. We lift up holy hands as your word promises, as your word commands. We lift up holy hands, oh God. Everybody watching me right now, lift your hands up. We lift up holy hands and give you praise, God. We praise you. We give you the honor. Do your name. Your name is due. And we call you the Lord, our banner, the Lord, our covering. The Lord that covers us, the Lord that goes before us, the Lord that covers, covers us, you are our banner, oh God. And we thank you, we give you the praise due your name. And now, God, we know you're going to honor your word because you're a God of your word. So we expect you to defeat Am Amalek for us because we have called you the Lord our banner. We expect you to blot it out, uh, blot out the name for the face of the earth. And we expect you to fight uh, against Amalek from generation to generation. So even when we're dead, you'll still be fighting that fight for us. I thank you for such a mighty promise because you are a mighty God and we give you the honor and the praise that's due your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, amen and amen. Well, I received all that. So I am blessed and edified, all right? So praise God. I want you to have a good week. I want you to get ready for those unusual blessings. Don't forget to study Elijah and Elisha this week to prepare your mind and heart for the unusual things that God is going to do. Don't forget to, from now on, call the Lord your banner and lift up hands to him. He'll fight for you. He'll blot the enemies out. He'll fight when you're dead. That blessing is going to roll forward to your children. What a mighty promise, okay? And I will be here next week at my usual time. Okay, next weekend is my birthday weekend, but I'm still going to be here, I think. My birthday's on, my birthday's a week from tomorrow. But I got a bunch of stuff going on Saturday and Sunday. But I'm pretty sure I'm still going to be do my broadcast on Sunday because I got some family stuff going on. So uh, I will let you know. Uh, if the Spirit of God tells me I can take a Sunday off, then I'll put a little video up and say, you know, no broadcast this week or whatever. But I will let you know. So check my page. Check my Facebook Live page. Check my Periscope. And check my Twitter. Okay? Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. Don't forget to like and share. And have a great week getting ready for those unusual blessings. Amen. God bless.